Good, welcome everyone. This is the ACID workshop about giving a better talk, either a better talk online or in person or as a poster. And so we're gonna talk about a number of different things today and have you work also today. So it's an interactive workshop. You're going to be doing some work in breakout groups, revising, revising um, titles, critiquing posters, and if there's time, talking to each other, trying to have good online presence as you speak to a camera. Not so easy to speak to a camera well, something that takes a little bit of practice. I'm Bruce Kirchhoff. I'm a faculty member at UNC Greensboro. I've been teaching scientific communication for some years now, mostly in connection with my colleague, Kim Cooney, who is the director of the Communication Center at UNC Greensboro. And I'll let Kim introduce herself. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, so I'm in Greensboro, North Carolina, USA, where um, there are in this country around 140 speaking centers. And we are one of the leading speaking centers. And the reason that we're one of the leading speaking centers is because uh, our campus is so amazing, so diverse, and our faculty like Bruce are, are, are interested in helping their students to become better communicators. And so we have all these amazing opportunities to work with faculty and students because faculty and students on our campus understand the importance of doing this work. But Bruce asked me to talk to you um, about <clears throat> why students show up for workshops like this or why students show up um, at our speaking center at all. And the bottom line is um, uh, students only come if their faculty members communicate value for it. That's normally the case um, for, for going into the speaking center. Now, that's not the case as you all have reported here. Um, most of the time, um, the students will not show up unless a faculty member on our campus requires it. Um, but on other campuses, sometimes the faculty member requires it, sometimes the faculty member suggests it, but what we have found that works the most often, the best, is when the faculty member actually joins the students um, in, in the work that we do. And so we've had, we've had faculty members join their students in workshops like this from the Joint School of Nanoscience and Nanoengineering here in Greensboro, and from our own campus in chemistry, and more recently um, in the spring semester, with an engineering um, faculty member and his students from Clemson. And so that's, those have been our experiences up until today. So we have found in our experience that students only take this training seriously if their advisor is recommending them to. We are very happy to learn that most of you are here because of your interest in this, not because of somebody told you to go. We actually didn't ask how many of you are students and how many of you are to have a permanent position already, but uh, perhaps that's not that important for us. What well, I do want to say to you, and I think what Kim would, would second here, is that you have an important role, not just in becoming better communicators yourself, but in encourage other people to do this. So you'll notice we have about half of the people who showed up who signed up for this workshop have actually showed up today. And that is about, that's typical for what we find for workshops. I've been sending out emails. If you signed up in advance, you got several emails from me reminding you about it. I've posted on the social media and things to remind people to come and try to get people to show up. But um, sometimes we have a lot less than 50% who sign up, who actually show up. So you, as people who are interested in this and who have dedicated yourselves to becoming better at communication, will I hope encourage others to do the same. Because the scientific landscape is changing, you're gonna to see today when we first start talking about titles, that if you look at science, and I assume it's the same in nature, people are not writing titles like they used to. Titles are completely changing and they're changing fast. They're changing a lot in, even in the last year, I've been watching them. We'll talk about what that means and what that means for you and about how you should be writing your titles, how you should be communicating scientifically. So what I'm really focused on, what Kim and I have been working on, is scientific communication for scientists speaking to scientists. There's another type of psychom that's out there where scientists speak to the general public, which it's very, also very important. Our focus is scientists speaking to scientists. Our feeling is that until we really get good at talking to each other, get really good at explaining our own research so that another scientist can easily understand it, we're not gonna really be good at taking, talking to the public. And we need all of us to be out there really good talking to the public. 
So I am the main presenter today. Kim is here as backup and she'll, I'm sure, make some comments in. But if things really fall apart and I lose internet connection or things, Kim is my backup for those. And we've done a lot of workshops together. It's our first online workshop, but which we're very happy to be here with. So those, <clears throat> that's where we are. So again, it's an interactive workshop. We've got 63 people here now. You can post questions in the chat. We would like to be able to uh, recognize you if you have questions. And so you can turn on your video if we have a question. I'm going to ask Kim to do that, to monitor the chat and make sure that we're getting the questions and then to recognize people if you want to then turn on the video and your microphone and you can ask a question and we can talk about things a little bit. If there are other people who want to get into those conversations, we could have little mini conversations here. I've asked people mainly to turn off their videos because I don't want to overload the internet. I don't know where you all are and what your internet situation is. And although mine seems to be pretty good, you never really know how this is gonna go. So I think it's better if we keep our videos off for now. Anything else I should say, Kim, before we get started? <laughs> no, I think, you're, I think you've done a great job, Bruce. Thank you. I'm gonna turn my video off. So we're gonna talk about titles. If you wanna think for a minute, and post some ideas in the chat. What should your title do? What's a title do for a paper or a poster or a talk? Why do you write a title? What's the function of the title? I'm gonna open my chat here so I can see it. So I've got one draw attention. I had a question about the recording being available afterwards. It will be available. I'll try to say more about that later. Call attention should be catching, capture attention. Determine, readers should determine if they're interested in the talk. Catch the general attention of the public. Draw attention to the right audience. Communicate the subject clearly. And general idea of what the talk's about. Entice the public to attend. Again, we're mainly going to be talking about scientists talking to scientists. So these are titles that you would give if you were posting an abstract in Botany 2020 or if you were writing an article for a major scientific journal. Short glimpse of what is included inside the contents. Communicate the subject. These are all great ideas. Give results. Be informative. So all of, all of these things are right in, in one way. There are still better titles than there are other titles. But if you look at main, most, many titles that you're going to see at this conference, for instance, or if you go to most journals, all of the things that you've said are the important functions of titles aren't met by the titles. Titles are doing something else, usually. Now, I'm saying you're right. I think the reasons that you've got there are right. You want to attract attention and you want to summarize your results especially summarize your results. But look at the titles and you can think about what they're really doing in those titles that we see. So I would say that a good title should be what we would say a simple, surprising, and concrete. This is pretty abstract right now, but we're going to use these ideas of a simple, surprising, concrete title when we look at some titles in just a second. Simple means, you know, terminology is fine. Complex terminology is okay or um, jargon is okay for a scientific audience. They're going to understand the jargon. So I'm not saying get rid of the jargon. That's all right in scientific titles. But don't overdo it. If you could say the same thing simpler without the jargon, maybe you should. If you need the jargon, it's a name of a gene or something like that, and that's important for your research. You need, it needs to be there. It's a scientific talk. Surprising. Well, you know, all research really should be surprising. Why are you doing research if you're not finding something new? Surprising means what's new about your research. Your title should convey to the audience what you have done that no one else has done before you. So they can look at your paper or your abstract or your poster and say, oh, I'm interested in that because there's something new here. And they can tell that from their title. You don't want them to have to read down halfway through the paper to find out, oh yeah, they actually did do something new here. It's not just rehashing the same thing. You want that to be in the title. Concrete is the least concrete of all of these terms, but it's easiest in a way to understand. You want it to be specific. You want the title to tell the audience what 
is what the paper's about as in as much detail as possible. We'll look at some examples and I think these things will become more clear. So you can keep these ideas simple, surprising, and concrete. Eventually, as you understand these ideas, you'll just think about writing clear titles and titles that are not clear. And you won't have to go through this process of saying, well, is this title simple? Is it surprising? Is it concrete? You'll just be able to say, is this a clear title or not? Let's look at some titles. Okay, so all of my examples come from science. They come from recent, recent issues of science. If you look on the Science Magazine's website, and I assume it's gonna be the same in nature, but I haven't checked there, you're going to find a lot of titles, especially in the last year, that clearly communicate the major result of the paper. Here's an example, bumblebees damage plant leaves and accelerate flower production when pollen is scarce. I mean, it, the title right there tells you what the major finding of the paper is. And you're gonna know if you wanna go into that paper and get the details. And because they put it so clearly, it's pretty interesting, which means it's surprising. That's, and that's what you're going for. So all of those things you wanted in a title, this kind of title does really well. And if you look then at the abstract, here's the abstract, we can see that actually that same point is made in the abstract and they're gonna make it in the main part of the paper too. So this is what you're going for in a title. And as I said, look at the, go to the Science Magazine's website and start looking through the titles. Now I only look through plant titles. So I put a search term in there and said, you know, plants only, that's all I wanted to look at. And I found in the last year, I'd say more than 50% of the titles are like this. They are clear, simple, surprising, concrete titles like that. So it's really changing fast. I say it's changing fast because if you go back to 2019 and you do the same search, you'll find less than a third, maybe 20% of the titles are like this. So people are catching on to this. If you look at the Botany 2020 website, well, you look at the Botany 2020 website and you tell me how many titles are like this. So it's something we can learn. And it's something I think that is very important. We're gonna look at three titles. Here's the second one. Root branching toward water involves post-translational modification of transcription factor, and there's a transcription factor ARF7. So there's jargon here, lots of jargon, but it still is a pretty good title. It talks about the, what the result is. It talks about there's post-translational modification. You've got an idea of what, the, what these guys did and for their work, and it talks about the gene that's involved, and so, um, or the transcription factor that's involved. And so if you were interested in the transcription factor, you would know that this is a paper that you want to read, or if you were interested in root branching. And if we look at their abstract, we can see again that this same result is right there in the abstract, except now they mention oxen here. Now, I'm put all these big abstracts up here. I know you don't have time to read them, and I'm not expecting you to read them. I'm just putting them there to show you that these highlighted portions are there. But I want to now highlight another portion of the abstract. If we look down at the bottom of the abstract, they say something else here. So SUMO, and you have to look up in here, small ubiquitin-like modifier proteins. So SUMO-dependent regulation of auxin response controls root branching pattern in response to water availability. So that's actually a little more general than the title that they used. And would, if they included this kind of information in the title, make the title more attractive to a larger audience. So they are obviously looking for people, or they thought they were looking for people who are interested in this transcription factor. But there might be other genes that are sumer dependent regulation, have work on this um, small ubiquitin-like modifier protein. And so you could think about changing the title to something like this, using that second part of the abstract. Sumo-dependent regulation of auxin controls root branching in response to water availability. It's still simple. It's still pretty concrete, not as concrete as the first one, not as specific as the first one, but there's a trade-off there. And it's surprising, right? I mean, it's not something I would have expected. And so it makes me want to learn, know more about this and know more about this research. Let's look more, one more 
title. So evolution of carnivorous traps from plantar leaves to simple shifts in gene expression. It's pretty good. It's not completely clear to an evolutionary biologist what they mean by evolution here, because that word is used in a lot of different ways. But it's clear that we're talking about carnivorous traps. So you can think about a number of different species there. There are simple shifts in gene expression. Well, that's interesting. That's an interesting topic that you're getting simple shifts and you're getting these complex traps being made. Let's look at their abstract. So here's got a couple things that now come out in the abstract. They're dealing with a model. So they're probably not actually doing um, the, the genetic research. I haven't looked at the paper in detail here, but they're saying they're printing a model that accounts for the formation of these two types of leaves through this change in gene activity. So we can use that to think about how we might write the, rewrite this title. So carnivorous traps can be produced from plantar leaves through simple shifts in gene activity or gene expression. It's a little more general. It takes out that world evolution because to an evolutionary biologist, they're not really dealing with evolution. They're not doing any kind of phylogenetic analyses. They're not looking in, the con in the evolutionary context. They're not looking at related species. They're looking at a single species and they're making a model of how carnivorous traps have develop, can develop in that. So it's really, to me, it's really a question or a paper about development. So we've taken out the, the term evolution from this. The word can is a little bit problematic here. And I don't know what you would want to say there, but this is a, there's a very interesting issue in this, at, at this point. They did a modeling study. So they don't know 100% that this is always going to work. It's not, we'd have to dig into the paper in a little more detail to see if they've really tested this at a molecular level um, in, the, in this species, Uticularia is what they're working with. So I put the word can in there as kind of a weasel word to soften their, their results. If they thought that they were really, if they, they thought their findings were really result, if they thought their results were really robust, they could just say carnivorous traps are produced from plantar leaves through simple shifts in gene expression, which would be much, a much stronger title. So when you're evaluating your title, you've got to think a little bit about how confident you are in your research. You don't want to misrepresent your research by writing these simple, concrete, surprising titles, but you want to write a title that's going to draw people in. It's an interesting trade-off and one you'll have to think about. So Mike and I agree, John, just about everything. Uh, we have a small little disagreement about what the oh, I'm excited. Mike has in his designs, and I'm sure he would uh, agree with me. It doesn't have to be this way, but he's got the title, which is a traditional kind of title, and then the title that we've been working on, which is the main finding of that goes in the middle of the poster. And I'm just telling them, make that main finding the title of their poster. I completely agree with you. We don't have to disagree with you disagreement now because the only purpose of a title is to convey that information sent which you know the, the punchline does already you don't really need a title it's just vestigial but people are so so we agree still i think <laughs> good there is no disagreement yeah we're good we're 100 <laughs> percent. bruce we are getting responses to the chat draw people in a snapshot of the talk that should engage the people visual representation of the research visual representation of a story all the details Proof <laughs> that I know what I'm doing. <laughs> Michael has something to say about that. A graphic summation of your research. The guy who said, uh, the girl who said, prove I know what I'm doing, I think was, was the most honest. <laughs> we have to start one-on-one -on -one discussions as another response. Visual representation as a uh, visible at a glance. Mm -hmm. Those are great. Opportunity to communicate your work in a visual manner, big opportunity. A big opportunity, I think, is a really great answer here. Yeah. Short research re uh, representation with figures and results, schematic representation of research, visual pictorial representation, visible in a glance, start one-on-one -on -one discussions. I think I read that one already. Draw on the audience is great. 
Yeah, these are all great because that I mean, you guys are focusing on the goals, which is the important part, right? I think people get hung up on the format a lot, but there's a lot of different ways to like, you know, show people your research in a visual way. Like there's a million ways to do that, right? And we get stuck on this typical like wall of text with the title on top kind of format of doing that. So I think that we've, I hope we've kind of captured the same ideas that I wrote down here. I, the And <clears throat> these are really kind of functions that are at odds with each other. It's very hard to meet these three functions. That is, you want to attract visitors. There's people wandering by the poster and they want to know if they're going to stop. They're at this huge poster session. Our poster sessions at Botany are not quite as big as this one, but there are places where we've got a thousand posters up at a time and they're up for two hours and they do another thousand after that. You got to attract somebody in that. You're going to talk to them, that great opportunity to have a conversation with people. And so you've got to have a backdrop for that presentation. And then if you're at places like the botany meetings where the posters stay up for a while, they've got to present your research so that people can find out about your research even when you're not present. Now I have one other thing that I think that posters really need to do. And I think it's the most important thing. And it builds off that idea that a person said it was a great opportunity. And that is, I think that the poster's main function is to get people to remember you. And I think that should be the essential function. But in science, we do that not by putting on clown hats and doing a dance, but by doing great research and presenting it clearly. And if we can do that, the people are going to remember you in that. So the extent to which you can meet those three functions of the poster, you can give a good presentation to them. The poster represents your research well. It attracts them when they're wandering by they're gonna have a better chance of remembering you. And if they remember you, when there's a job open, they're gonna say, well, why don't I just send this announcement to, you know, to Hannah or to Joe or to, I saw a poster that they did the other day. That's what you want. That's the essential thing you want to get you exposure. So I'm gonna stop talking in, in just a minute. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mike, I got you here, but I wanted you to hear these. No, you're good, go it now, take your time. I want Mike to tell you about Better Poster too, because it's going to meet some of these things. He also talks about this same thing that I'm going to do here. And this is how people tell you how to lay out posters. If you go to a graphic designer, they will show you something like this. I watched an hour long presentation from people at BioRender a couple weeks ago. And their whole point of how to lay out the poster was to make it look like this. And that they said, you're going to read a poster like this, right to left, like it's text. And both of those things are completely wrong. You don't want to have posters laid out that way. And people do not read posters in that way. They don't read them like their text. And I'll show you eye tracking data in a few minutes that'll show you that. One of the common ways that people look at posters, and this is from eye tracking data on websites, is like this. They'll look at the top and scan the top, and then they'll start looking down the poster to look for information. As they do that, because we read in Western languages left to right, they will look over. And so it gives this F-shaped pattern, which is a very common way that people will read posters. But notice my background here. This is how people read posters if you lay them out in this normal way. And if you are getting an eye, if you had eye tracking data for all your posters and you were getting this pattern, you would say, this is bad. I do not want people to be doing this on my poster. I want a person to come in and I want them to look at the most important thing, the central result of my poster, and to get that at a glance because then they're going to come over and talk to me about the poster. And the part that has that in your poster is the center of the poster. So even though this F pattern is used, and I'll show you evidence that people look at posters this way, these are not the best posters the best posters are gonna put a nice graphic or something in the front middle of the poster. And that is where the person's gonna look. Eye tracking data shows that they do this. These posters are incredibly attractive to people and you're gonna get a ton of people coming to talk to you if you do that. So the F pattern is the death of the poster. And now I turn it over to Mike. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, so this is the original better poster. Um, would it be okay, Bruce, if I share my screen? Absolutely. Uh, oh, okay, cool. Let's see, so I'm gonna, so I've got some, uh, before people have a very controversial reaction to that initial one. And so I've got some new layouts now that I think usually more people like. Um, 
and the, the first one is great. I mean, and we're going to see. It, no, it functions perfectly. It's just like some people, it's a very visceral sort of uh, like, wait a minute, where's all my stuff? You know, like it's, uh, you know, like it's, it's like, so, like, usually it's about like 80, 20, like for the, for that first one, the first one, like 80% of people are like, oh, it's great. I get it. You know, and then like 20% are like 19% are like, I don't know. It's, you know, where's all the stuff? And then like 1% just hates me. Um, so but I've designed new layouts, uh, but you know, as Bruce was saying, like functionally they're great. And actually I've actually pushed posters to be more minimalist. I've tried even more minimalist posters than the green one you saw um, and they still worked even better. Um, so function is different from that visceral reaction. Can you guys see my, yes. uh, my screen now? Okay, cool. Yes, we're seeing it. Great, okay. So um, these are sort of the better poster family now, right? So you had the original better poster, which was more like this. Um, this is the template for it. Um, which is just your main finding in the middle. This is actually just a PowerPoint template, um, but it's your main finding in the middle with a big key figure. Um, usually uh, this is kind of consistent with, I think some of the eye tracking research that both Bruce and I have probably seen, and Bruce probably done, done it more himself, um, like uh, where people are attracted to negative space, big figures, right, and, and punchlines. Like in eye tracking studies, people like skip most of the poster and go to the conclusion. So what better poster version one is is a big block of negative space with a punchline and a big figure in it, which is pretty consistent with what we see in the research on eye tracking. Um, and then you have these sidebars, kind of like speakers on a TV. Um, and the sidebars are hard to make sense of if you don't think about them without bodies. So if you think of where people stand in a poster session, um, you generally have a presenter on one side and the attendee is on the other side and they like, the, the presenter's personal bubble is a factor, right? Like you don't, if you're gonna get close enough to somebody, you're just gonna ask them, you're not gonna read the poster, right? So the left-hand bar is kind of people, I called it the, uh, the silent presenter, but some people have called it the introvert bar. Um, so here's an example of one. So people can read your introvert bar without having to go into your personal bubble. These are just examples. Um, so here, notice he's standing over here. Somebody could read that sidebar without totally having to talk to him if they didn't, if they were, you know, didn't, were in the mood to have a discussion. Um, and I've seen people do that on my own posters where people don't want to talk to me yet. They just want to read my sidebar for a second. So that position is very intentional. The Mark, other thing that- Excuse me, we have a request to you um, if you can zoom in more of the poster oh, so sure. that we can see better. Excuse Sorry me for interrupting you. No, please do. Um, so let's go back to the original one. I just changed this recently. So that's, um, so here's one that I think Bruce is gonna show. Um, I hope it's a little bigger. Oh. Sorry about this. And, and Mike, there's another question that asks if you could show a landscape version. I know you have them. The uh, portrait version? Yeah, this is Port landscape. Right. Yeah, um, yeah, I do. So the, the portrait version is basically, um, let me get over to that. It's basically, just the punchline on top, and then you can use your own. Um, it's like this. Was the first portrait version. I hope that helps. Um, and there are some examples in this template file. Um, but yeah, the general idea. We big main. Go ahead. Didn't appear on our screens. Oh, it didn't. Sorry. Um, Thank you, Megan. Let's see. You might have to- There we uh, go, how about now? Yeah, there we go. You're in. Oops, sorry, I was sharing the wrong screen. Sorry, everybody, I'm really sorry about that. Um, so this is the portrait version. And this is the landscape version. Um, so you can, all that stuff I said, hopefully it makes sense now that you can see it. You have the big main finding in the middle with a key figure. Um, you can read this at a distance. The other thing the sidebars do is they help you orient like you, if you were looking for the person's like contact details, you could probably go right here pretty quickly. Um, the other side is if you um, were looking for just the figures, they feel crammed over here, but if you were standing an inch from them, they'd probably be pretty readable. This is just version one. Um, in recent versions, I'll show you where it's going now. Um, this is another one. Um, can you guys see this, Kim? Okay, teach people yes. something cool you learn in five seconds, cool. Yes. Um, so this is, I hate that it switches. Um, this is one of the more recent ones. Um, 
so this you have similar to that F pattern Bruce was saying, which Bruce, I love that you brought that up because like that's as a former web developer, F pattern was my life. You know, you, every website you ever read is designed with the F pattern. And I've never heard anyone mention it until you just did in all in my eight years in science now, which has been kind of crappy, but it's absolutely true. And so this is more in line with that F pattern. It's literally an F shape, right? You have the, the main takeaway with a visual really quick um, so that if people don't stop at your poster, and this is key, like, Traditional posters, you think about it as people have to stop to learn. And that's really your biggest audience is the people walking by. And so I'm trying to sort of push people to use posters that teach everybody something, like the 200 people walking by and the four people who stop, you know? And that's, uh, that's something that this is starting to do. Um, so the left, you have the key takeaway, and then you have very big key figures on the right. Um, usually you only have a, key, a few key figures. I have a friend who's a, uh, an illustrator for scientific posters and you know, she, had, she worked with a scientist who wanted to put like 60, 60 graphs on his poster, you know? And she was like, which one's the most important? And he just said, all of them. And then like, there's no, in, in, a, in a scientific paper, you want to include everything. But on a poster, there just isn't time. If you put everything on there, you're going to overload people and they're going to get nothing. So the idea here is to really think more in terms of teaching people one thing you learned really deeply with your methods, with your data, um, and with visualizations versus trying to fit your 20 studies onto one poster board. Um, and then you have a QR code here to link to, the, uh, to a copy of the full paper when they want the details. So you're able to sort of put that in a layer. It also, something to notice is it um, deprioritizes the like, credits and details and things like that. Usually in the traditional design that Bruce showed, you put your like, like the second thing they notice after your title is all your author names, right? And like, that's very traditional in science, you know, like, like credit is the currency of science, but like also like usually in a poster session, you're wearing a name tag or they clicked it in your name somewhere. And like, that's the names are the least relevant thing for learning, right? They're the most relevant thing for your goals, but for the attendees goals, they really hijack the learning experience. So we're trying to take sort of a movie credit approach with, um, with the credits so you can just sort of put all your credits down at the bottom where people can still find them but they're not interrupting that learning experience um so this is another one i'll show you one more and i'll turn it back to bruce um this is the other new layout that's called the figure hero um so if you have a, key, a really big hero figure you could do it here and have sort of an awning and then you can use I, I, this isn't actually my idea a lot of people have used uh, methods flow charts to summarize their methods really succinctly which work really super well in person and then if you really want to go for it you can try something like this. This is the entire poster. So if you have a really beautiful data visualization, you can just make it the whole poster because like really this is such a famous data visualization that was like, this was put on like pants and cars and stuff. Um, like people painted it on walls and stuff. And really like if you were to try to put anything on this, it would detract from it, right? Like this is starting to blur that line between science and art. And if you have a really beautiful data visualization, really that plus maybe a paragraph about the methods for collecting it, is really gorgeous and people will remember it. And then people can snapshot the QR code and get all your details and everything like that too. So these are okay. some new ones, that's it. Mike, a question from Carla in the comments. Sure. Uh, is there, a, are they equally effective uh, portrait and landscape? Does it matter? So I've developed the portrait more, I'm sorry, the landscape more. Um, really any poster, posters right now, as Bruce was alluding to, are so ineffective, like they communicate almost nothing. Um, and even if you look at pictures of poster sessions, people don't even look at the poster. Um, they look at the person. And so you're really fighting a low bar. Um, and I think any, any poster where you use that principle of, of that main takeaway is the first thing they see, keep things big, whether portrait or landscape is going to be better. It's really, people ignore most content on posters, especially if you're standing there, right? Um, it's less so if they're reading online. But if you're standing there, if you think about a portrait um, or a, yeah, a portrait layout, your goal is to get them to read everything on your poster, right? And usually they will read about 2% if that. So the key is you gotta put less on there. So you know, a portrait poster with, depending on how you design it, if you put just your key figures on it, kind of like this setup on a portrait with your main punchline at the top, that would destroy most posters in the room in terms of effectiveness. In terms of landscape versus, post versus portrait, landscape gives you more space. You can make fonts bigger, um, unless you're doing like a really hilariously big um, portrait. The other, um, but Besides the more space, it's really how you design it. I'll show you one more um, for portrait. So in the Better Poster SQL video, this is just launched. Um, 
there's a really great example from someone who used a portrait layout really creatively um, right here. So this was her original portrait poster and you can see her eyes go straight to the punchline. She's got big key figures right here with her eye tracking data, right? Um, and like right away that communicates the methods too. You're like, oh, I get it, it's eye tracking because the little like blocks and stuff, right? And you're taking away so much from the middle of this poster that you almost don't even need the, the rest, right? So I created a redesign of this one where you could use tags for the methods and then you actually put a little like hair on top, right? To make it more fun, which would also make you remember it. So this study is about um, where people look and how they look at the hairline when determining race and like, which is a big finding and really doing something kind of fun like this um, with the hair on top, provided that it doesn't obstruct vision for the rest of the session would help you remember that. You're like, oh, people look at the hair because that poster was designed like a freaking forehead, right? Um, that those kind of things, even if you got to use scissors, would just make your findings so much more memorable. And then down here, what I did um, was I pulled out just the main part of her uh, conclusion paragraph, which was already really well written, um, to tell you like why this study matters. Because in Alabama, um, of course, Alabama, it is currently legal to legal to discriminate people against uh, against people due to their hair. And then I've got just the tags like n equals twenty and eye tracking. Which is really, if you're standing there and the people are standing here and like you can ask Jen and Alex here any question you want, you're not getting a lot from their poster. Like you're really gonna ask them. And so the poster right here, you're gonna read all of this and then you're gonna already know basically their methods, their in, their, their main finding and why it matters before you even start talking to them, which means you're gonna ask these much deeper questions. Um, so something like this would be great. Um, again, I know this is a break with tradition, but this follows the rule of like, people will read every sentence on a poster like this. On a poster, if it's more cluttered, they'll read almost no sentences because it'll just overload them is my experience anyway. Um, so that's a, that's a portrait example. That's my favorite portrait poster. Um, it really depends on how you use the space. Is that helpful so far? Anything else you guys wanna know? That's really great, Mike, thanks so much. Don't, please, <clears throat> Stick around if you can. We're going to look at some other posters here and you can comment on them as I'm commenting on them. And then we're going to ask people to go out and critique some of the posters that they posted on the web on a uh, Google Doc site. You don't need to stay around for that. But if you can, of course, I'm sure they'd love to have your comments on those sites too. So oh, sure. Absolutely. Let me go back and share my screen again. Okay. So I want to look at this. I want to analyze some posters. And this is one of the ones that Mike showed. And <clears throat> I, he shows it, I found out it from him and he shows it and I show it because this is just about the most perfect poster I've ever seen. And I it's didn't- My favorite too, Bruce, just, it's incredible. He did a great job. <laughs> until I started analyzing it. And mm -hmm. I, I'm gonna show you um, eye tracking data in just a minute and that just, backs up everything we're going to say. So let's look at the feature of this poster. So the main result is right in the center of the poster. Here's the traditional title up here. There's no reason they couldn't be the same, but he's got them slightly different here. It's right in the center. Not only is it in the center, he's got a graphic that is relevant. So we're as botanists, we perhaps we don't know that supercomputers are used to model turbulence. This is a model of turbulence. This image is directly relevant to what he's saying in the poster. So when someone walks by this poster and they see an image right in the center and they know it's of turbulence and they know he's got something to do with, he's talking about floating numbers and these other weird kinds of posit numbers, shorter versions of um, representation complex numbers. They know it's about turbulence and they're interested already. And not only that, he's got a graphic visualization of the difference between what a 16-bit float looks like, all of these binary representations here, and a 16-bit posit, this little thing here. So he's got that right in the center of the poster too. And then he's got on the sides, lots of data that he's gonna use when he talks. Now, this poster was only shown while he was present. There were about a thousand other posters up at the same time as what he says. This is one of those meetings in Europe where there's just huge numbers of people going. So he had to stand out in that. His poster was never up when he wasn't there. So it did not have to explain anything when he wasn't there. So that's a big advantage to him because he can attract people with this center part of the poster. He then has the data that he needs here to explain to them why 16-bit posits are better 
are better, and these are comparisons of simulations. Now, let's just suppose that this poster was up when he wasn't there. How would they be able to understand that? There's a QR code down here. You're gonna see from the eye tracking data that people are gonna look at it right away. This links to a full paper. This, there's a published manuscript on this, and this links to that manuscript. So even if they didn't understand these diagrams, this QR code links to it. Let's look at some other things about the design. You might have noticed that this design has a very substantial uh, substantiality to it. It really feels like it's present in that, and that's because he's got these nice white bars on the side, and they're anchored at the bottom by all of these um, icons. So the QR code, when you put that in, it creates some dead space next to it, right? So there's usually some blank spaces in the areas next to the QR code. He's used that to put the icons that represent his different organizations, universities and so on. And he's balanced that over here on the right side with the same kind of information. So that has given the whole poster a weight. You see sometimes posters that use colored gradients, lighter at the top and darker at the bottom. I'll show you some examples of those in a minute. It's difficult to make those work. I don't recommend them because of that, but he has done the same thing by putting his QR codes and his university logos down here. And as Mike said, they're not the most important thing, but they need to be there. It's got a picture of the author. It's got a picture of the author where you can actually see his face. Now, if he's standing there, it's not as important. But if he's not standing there, as he is in all our cases, you want a picture of yourself on the poster so that when people look at this, they can associate you with the poster. And then they see you in the hallway, they say, I really liked your poster. And you've made a contact with someone outside of the poster session. So I think a, po a picture of yourself is an essential feature, a picture of yourself that is clear, not a picture of yourself standing in the field with your favorite plant, which shows that you love the plants, but it doesn't let someone identify you. The picture, the, the reason the picture's there is so they can identify you. Eye tracking data. So this is, the, this is simulation of eye tracking data. This is from a company called iQuant. They do not work with scientists. They, don't, they work with only the big, biggest companies. You can't contract with them to get this stuff done. They were very kind in running some posters for me. So I big thank you to iQuant for doing this. Here's what we saw eye tracking with um, Milan's poster. Where do the people look? They look in the center. Red means this is where they're looking most. They're looking exactly where you want them to look in order to get the information. And they're looking at the QR code. It's kind of amazing there. They're not looking very much at the sides, but you don't need to look at the sides. You want them to get the main point of your poster. This is eye, eye tracking data or simulations of eye tracking data from the first three seconds. So this is someone walking by your poster and seeing um, if, they, if they're interested. They are obviously going to be interested in this poster. And Milan says that he was in this room with 1,000 other posters. He had never less than two people at his poster. He had people crowding around his poster when there was no one on either side of them. He said he felt pretty bad for those people on the other side of them. This is what a good poster design can do for you. It can attract people when other posters are just being ignored and it can deliver to them something important about your research. Mike, do you have any comments about this poster or things? Um, no, I think this obviously this is kind of what I expected, you know, like how you can't miss it. Um, I think it's interesting that they focus on those keywords. I think when people walk through a poster session, they're looking for those keywords they understand, but it, it is just great. I'm glad it performed well. Did you, did you send this to Milana? I bet he'd love to see this. I did. I sent it to him. Okay, great. Yeah, no, keep going. You're good. So here's a very unusual design. I wanted to show you another one that's um, really non-traditional to show you that you don't have to do the better poster way, but you do have to do you have to follow all the principles that Mike has laid down in Better Poster. Now, the Better Poster works great, and please do it if you like it. But if people are saying, I just can't do it, I'm not going to do Mike's. So use the same kind of principles that Mike is talking about. So what kind of principles do we see in this, in this poster? There are problems with it, but there are some really good things about it. Let's first of all just look at the general outline of the poster. We've got a picture of the author up here. 
we have a very unusual design that is very destabilizing. You don't know where to look on it. And so where, what she did to fix that was she put pictures on the four corners. And that has stabilized the poster so that you're going to be focusing on the middle. And what do you see when you look in the middle? You see what, that they're doing a modeling study and that the modeling study has some results here. Now she's put a lot of data here on this, really too much data to see. But I know some people want to really include a lot of data. She's done it in a very effective way. You're going to have to get really close to see that data, but you can get in there and look at it if you want to. All of her points are made with, with bullet points. They come, and so they're easy to read and easy to follow through what it is. The arrow, how to flow through this poster because you need the arrows there with an unusual poster design like this. The problem with her is she hasn't got a good title. It's, it's a general scientific title. This is a poster from 2012, so we don't expect a QR code at that early. Of course, that would really help, but it was a very early poster compared to what the use of QR codes. And as I say, the title doesn't really um, catch you in terms of putting her main result out there. Other than that, I think it's a great poster. And the, the eye tracking data shows that it works. So they're looking at the top of the poster, they're looking a little bit at the title, but then they're looking right in the center where I, where I said they're gonna look because it's, the poster is anchored with those four pictures on the side. The center part of the poster has something that is relevant to this and they're looking at, they're doing modeling and they do the found that, they see what they found and they followed up with the found to see what the species are that they're working on. That's what you want. You've got their track, you've attracted people and now they're gonna want to walk in and find out more about how this poster works. So another very, very different design, but another really great design, but it's idiosyncratic, right? You couldn't reproduce this design on your same poster. So the main takeaways here are use the center effectively, put really important information there, use images to attract attention, the images have to be relevant to what you want the author, what you want the um, visitors to take away and use a good title. Use a title that succinctly ex expresses your results. Mike, you've never seen this poster or do you have any things you'd like to add? I've, I've never seen it. I think um, maybe a, a key takeaway, I think that there's a lot of effort you have to put in to get something from this, um, except that it's about birds. Um, and I think maybe some kind of low effort layer would help. Um, you really like try to really teach in five seconds. Don't just say something in five seconds. Like if they don't read anything else, if they just walk by it, help them take away something. Yeah, I think that would be better. That's what I was trying to get at with the title. And she's yeah. down here in the conclusions that really should be in the title. I'll yeah, exactly. Yeah, same deal. Yeah. And then bring, the, bring those, highlight those, those features out there. I mean, this, <clears throat> she did this when she's a graduate student. If you look on Figshare and you look for um, Nicole Barker, you'll find other posters that she's done. They're all pretty good and she's maintained same kind of design sense in all the posters that she's done this. This was that, 2012. That, that's great. I think that she's putting them on Figshare to me. Like she's putting them on Figshare and she's trying really novel things with posters to me as a sign of somebody who's doing a really good job with posters. And like, you know, she's already breaking the tradition with this, which is awesome. Um, so yeah, I think this is, this is really great. Bruce, if I could add something, kind of the elephant in the room. Um, some of us are students and we have advisors who are pushing a particular type of um, poster design. And if you find yourself in that situation, then uh, Nicole is giving us some opportunities to push in, in, in the right direction while sticking within a particular template that may not be effective. Right. And uh, we'll, let's, we'll, look at, look some other, we'll look at a couple other examples of posters here just in the next couple of slides. And you'll see other ways of doing this that are more traditional, but you've got to keep these ideas in mind that you're trying to communicate your essential result. You don't read posters. Most people don't read posters left to right. Um, they read them by looking at the center. They read them as pictures. There is an exception. Now Mike's new designs that have that take advantage of the F-shaped scanning pattern are different. If you use one of those designs, you would do, be doing both. You'd be taking a advantage of people's wanting to get the essence of the poster right away and the fact that they are likely to read in an F-shaped scanning pattern. Those are really great new designs. But 
I hadn't thought about that. I'd seen those designs. I hadn't thought about them in this context, so I didn't include them here. I'm glad that Mike mentioned them. Oh, I do want to say um, I am writing a book on <clears throat> short communication and it will include posters. And so it's going to say most of these things in there. And so we hope that it's going to be out in about a year. We're still in the process of writing it. I've just sent the poster chapters to Mike for comments. And so there'll be some ammunition out there. If you want to say, I want to design a poster in a different way, there'll be some uh, a published book out there saying, do it, do it this I way. Will. That, that's super helpful. I can, now I can refer people to your book, Bruce. I wanted to add to this. Maybe this is too bitter, but like if your advisor tells you you can't, if your advisor in science tells you you're not allowed to experiment, like that's a red flag, right? Like, um, and I think like that's usually they're wrong to me. Like, and, and if you can have ammunition, especially if there isn't a lot of evidence behind the traditional design. So if you have, if you have Bruce's book, if you have this webinar, if you have, forget my layouts, just use every reference I cited in that SQL video. Like you have a lot of evidence on your side for trying something different. And the video, I sent you a link to Mike's website. He's on open science framework. Um, and all of his stuff is in the public domain. So his two videos are linked there and you can watch them there. They're also on YouTube, but you can find them at that link. And so that's in the chat. So here's another poster. This is from last year's botany meetings. It's a really nice design. Some unique things that they've done here. Look at the colors. They've linked things thematically with color. So they've got a top title. It's a good title. Um, it summarizes the main point of the research. That's reinforced by the data in the center of the poster. And then the color tells them there's a thematic link to the data that's put over here on the, on the right, which tells you more about the bees. And then there's the research question over here. And so the green then you can say is kind of background stuff, discussion methods, right? These are all less important things. They could even be de-emphasized more than they are, but the difference in the color shows that here. We've got the author's names up at the top, but they're not really big. I'd like to see a picture of them. The picture of the authors is down here in the corner with their really tiny text with their acknowledgments and some references, which is that's nice that it's so small, but I'd really like to see their faces here. Not just that they love their research, which is great, but I'd like to see what they look like in these pictures. Their school is down, down here in the lower left and that's a good place for it. It's a little large, but not bad. Overall, a really, ni a really nice poster. Um, I would li have liked to see these diagrams of the bees over here so that there was a really clear link. I'd like to see these abbreviations a little clearer. My, these are minor points, a very nice kind of design. The eye tracking data is not as good here. And we're seeing that F-shaped pattern. So looking for data here. Now remember, this is the first three seconds. And this is a generalist looking at this. This is, it may represent how a scientist, but it may not. A scientist may look at these graphs a lot more um, closely than the eye tracking data suggests they were. So here's a case where it may not be, the eye tracking data may not be correct. But we do see the edge pattern and we see them trying to find meaning in the title down the poster and then looking across and they pick up the name pollinator. And from there, they would probably go on to look at the graphs. When I first looked at this poster, I was first attracted to the graphs as a scientist. Mike, again, this is a poster you haven't seen before. I have not seen this one. Um, I love they went, they went for the size of the graphs. You know, like small graphs are usually a bad thing. And this, they really went for it with this. I love the little bees in there. Um, it's just great. I think probably just more negative space around the punchline would have fix the eye tracking. Um, like if they had gone like, you know, 75% of the size and left more space to discover that punchline, it probably would have helped with the eye tracking. Mike, can you give us a quick definition of negative space? Oh, sir, sure, sure, of course, sorry. Basically it's empty space. Um, so like the amount of space around the text, if you think of like right now, when you read the top, like native bees vary in quantity, um, your eye is trying to like, you read kind of ahead a little bit. And so you're trying to like, filter out those sides. You're filtering out like that black border on the left. You're filtering out like the graph below it kind of encroaching on it, right? And you're, that, that's cognitive load, right? If there were just empty pink space around it, you wouldn't have to filter as much and it creates more contrast. And so usually your eye will go to wherever the most contrast is first. 
And so um, here, I guess the I guess they're trying to make sense of the graph first. They go to the graph first because it's the biggest. That's the biggest contrast. But I think yeah, adding some empty space. Um, I don't know why it's called negative, but it is like the idea of empty space around around the signal um, to help you detect it. If that makes sense, is that helpful? Yes, thank you. I, I was just concerned because we have international audience here. Oh sure. Yes, I, it is um, the space around the signal, the space that sets off the signal, <clears throat> and we differentiate it from what's called dead space. There's an example of dead space here also. See this little space right here? It's not doing anything. This space is just captured. It's not helping and set off anything. This image could have been made a little bit bigger, could have cropped it a little better, extended it out this way a little better, made it fit with these other images a little better, and you would have gotten rid of that dead space there. That's not the same thing as negative space. Negative space on Milan's poster with the big blue center, that's a great example of that. The information is right in the center. It's got a blank space around it that says really pay attention to what's in the center there. That's a beautiful example of negative space. So we do not want posters that look like this. What happens if we make a poster that looks like that with eye tracking data? So here we have a Typical poster I took off of Figshare. Think for a minute, what do you think that people are looking at on this when they look at eye tracking data? Where are they looking? Where would you look on this poster when you first saw it? Well. We are getting answers in the comments. If you want to, I haven't. I've got that closed right now. Can you're saying graphs, um, the title, the middle. Someone said that they would look away. Yeah, look away is about that. Look at that. Case Western Reserve gets a lot of attention on this, and that's probably not what you wanted them to know where you were from. Um, it's kind of all over the place here, a little bit on the title. They're looking for some information there. There's remnants of the F-shake pattern of scanning. Top, a little bit down, but there's just nothing in here to look at, so why would you look there? And then they're trying to find some information here. There's a little bit there. So they're looking a bit at the big, there's just not much to see there with eye tracking. It's not an attractive poster. I can't imagine many people would come up to look and look and read this. This is a poster where he's trying to prove something to someone, but it's not communicating with the audience in terms of what his results are, what's unique about him. Here's the same kind of thing, <clears throat> except it's got more colors in it. Think a little bit about what is attractive of this. What eye tracking would you expect to see here? I'm going to reopen the chat. So pictures, title. Think about where on the title were you looking? Where do you think you're going to, people in the first three seconds are going to look? The pictures are pretty attractive. And so people are probably going to be attractive to those. Again, you've got to think about what's the most important thing here. Do you want to know? Is the takeaway message what your study species are, or is that subsidiary and you want them to know something about what the model showed? Straight to the middle picture is maybe here or here. What's at the top left? They said, though, it's an I, I think that's some seagulls shown in a diagram. So, right, they looked at the title and the center of the title there. So it's the title is set off by these two big words, modeling and albatross. And look at that, they didn't look at that. They looked at the biogenetics of foraging behavior. <clears throat> so that's not actually bad, you know. They might look a little bit at modeling and so that they know something about your re what your research is about. This is kind of an example of what Mike was talking about, negative space, although they're using the words there to set off that center part of the title and it's focusing the attention on that center. And then there's some aspects of the title here. So basically a poster with way too much data on it. Um, it's got some interesting information that's attracting some attention. They're being a, people are being attracted by the color and the pictures and you might get some people walking up there but they're not looking at the text and things, and that's gonna be very off-putting to know what that is. Now, we wanna know just not only that they did a modeling study, but what the results of that study were. Now, modeling studies, phylogenetic studies, things like that often have a lot of different results, right? There's more than one thing that comes out of the study. Pick one. You can tell them about the other ones if you get them up to look at your poster. 
But if you try to put them all in the title, you try to put them all right there in front of them, they're not going to look at it and you don't get a chance to tell them any. So pick one, pick the most important one, highlight that in your poster, make sure your visuals are related to that. Make sure that the poster's got a good design, you'll draw them in and then you can tell them about the other results that you've got and they'll be interested in it by that point. Some ideas, what do you think it takes to do a good talk online? Go ahead and put your ideas in the chat. Energetic, confidence, enthusiasm. Those are good things. Confidence, enthusiasm, energetic. Catch the attention of the audience, speak to the audience. Speak to the audience is very important and that's very hard to do online. The audience is your camera and it really works well if you can look directly at the camera. That was from Nadia. Not easy to do. Well, let's take a look at some people who have good online presence and talk a little bit about how they've done that. I'm gonna look at three videos. <clears throat> First of all, Steve Washer. Steve is a business consultant and he is very polished in his online presentation. His website has a series of videos that teach people how to do this. He also would love to consult with you if you had a business to teach you how to do it more in your business. He says he does it on a budget, but Steve's budget is like $2,000 to get the setup. You're gonna see the, what you advantage of this that he's got of $2,000. He actually spent more than $2,000 on the setup that you're gonna see him using in a minute to get the really nice videos and really nice connection. But I want you to see it because I want you to see kind of what the high end of this looks like. Dominic Slauson is just a technology consultant at uh, uh, Community College in Minnesota, I think. And his video is not gonna be as polished as Steve's, but he's still gonna maintain a good connection with the audience. And so what I want you to see is that it's not dependent upon having a really high-end kind of equipment. Um, Steve has got a not a screen reader, a text, you know, where it displays the text in front of your face. So you can look directly at the camera and you can read off the text. I've been trying to think of what those are called for three days. Kim is going to remind me now. It's a teleprompter. A teleprompter. He's got a $1,600 teleprompter that he says you can get a couple hundred dollar teleprompters, but he's got a teleprompter. We don't usually have a teleprompter, even a $300 one, and Dominic does not have a teleprompter, yet he still maintains a good connection with the audience. So I want you to see how he does that. And the last one is a scientist, Christine Solomon. It is not an online presentation, but it, it's a very short clip of her speaking at my university a little over a year ago. And she's going to show you some many of the techniques that we've used in a different kind of context. So she's going to speak very well, good audience connection. And I want you to look at her, <clears throat> at her slides and tell me a little bit about what's so good about her slides and see if you can relate what she's doing with her slides to what we've been talking about with posters. Because we've, not everyone does posters, right? Some people give talks where they're putting together slides. The same principles that we're using when we're talking about posters work well with slides. So we're just gonna see a very short, lead, a very short clip of Christine presenting so you can think about that a little bit. So let's hope that these videos work. You let me know if they do not work in your they do not come through. Let's go a little deeper. Picasso said that art is the lie that tells the truth. Think of video technology as the lie. It's standing between you and another person. It adds all kinds of artifice and architecture. It changes nearly everything about how you come across. And yet, it's also telling a profound truth about who you are. It penetrates our defenses. It can also magnify the part of our personality that we want to be known for. And if that part of you is the truest part of you, then video becomes the lie that tells the truth even more efficiently than you might be able to face to face. And to me, that's simply miraculous. The key to unlocking this media magic is clarity on who we are in relationship to our viewer. That is made up of only two elements. The first is bringing our big self to the camera. We, we want to treat our videos as if they were chances to speak to some very important people. Because they are, we're speaking to our future clients, many for the first time. What's that first impression worth? No matter how we may feel in the moment before we start speaking, 
we have the opportunity to slow this down and think about who we want to be once we hit the record button. I think the best way to do this is to be someone who gives first. That's our big self. That's the one who knows he needs nothing from that particular person because he's in it for the long haul. Who knows that connection is more important than transaction. The one who gives 100%, who doesn't hold back or play it safe because they know that if they get the elements right, the media is out, the video will protect them. That's job one. The second is being very clear on our message. This includes knowing who needs what we have and how they interpret how they need it and being able to explain it all in just a minute or two. Bottom line, if we want our future clients to embrace our authentic image, we must give enough. Okay, these videos run into each other very quickly, so I'll stop it here before we go on and look at Dominique. So I hope you see how nice that was and what a nice job he did in presenting. You really felt you had a very intimate connection with Steve when he was talking like that. He has practiced a lot to get to that point. <clears throat> so he's gonna go on and talk about later in that same video, how you have to practice your talk. So even though he's got a teleprompter in front of them, he's done this more than once and he's practiced this more than once and he's probably shot it more than once to get to that level of perfection. We can't do that as scientists. We don't have the time to do that, especially as graduate students, we don't have the time to do it. But the essence of what he's saying is, is right. So you want to bring your authentic self to the presentation. You want to, be, you want to be as comfortable with material as you can. You want to have simplified your message. You want to understand that basic core message you're gonna present. And you want to be comfortable in talking to your audience about that, even though you can't see that audience. And the second part was simplify your message, which we've worked on this whole, this whole time. So even though you're not gonna be Steve Wasser, you can be really good on screen if you follow those same ideas that he has said. Simplify the message, be your authentic self, and bring that authentic self to the screen. That's often gonna mean as looking at the camera as much as you can. Steve did not stare at the camera. He looked at the camera, he looked away. As if he was thinking, he looked back at the camera. And by doing this, he gave a sense of his immediacy, it's kind of funny that not by staring at the camera or by looking always at it, but by looking away sometimes and looking back sometimes, but always keeping your focus on your audience, you come across much better than if you were to just to stare directly at the camera or if you were to look away from the camera all of the time. We're gonna see Dominic doing these same kinds of processes in a less, um, using the same kinds of techniques <clears throat> in a less formal setting. So he is not as practiced as Steve was. He has probably not practiced this video multiple times, but he's still got a really great presence on the screen. Let's see what he looks like. Another way that we can utilize Canvas Studio is for weekly check-ins. Now, this is something that I feel is very, very important. It, it is critical to online instruction that we do weekly check-ins. And the basic idea, and it doesn't have to be weekly, I should say, um, it could be in a shorter time frame than that, maybe longer, but you wanna make sure that you are present for your students. Um, we wanna increase teacher presence. Uh, in a face-to-face -face class, it's very easy for the teacher to be present, but for an online class, it can often feel like the teacher's not even there. So if you do weekly check-ins with your students where they see you, that increases teacher presence and makes the students feel like you're actually there, you're able to answer their questions. Um, now, with those check-ins, what can you do? Well, number one, you can motivate your learners. Um, you can recognize the accomplishments that they've had up until this point, and you can also call out the great ideas that they had in a previous week and, and really say like, hey, I really liked your contribution to the discussion last week, um, and, and call them out by name. Uh, I think that's very, very beneficial for students. Um, also, it gives you a chance to do class-wide feedback. Um, you may find as you're assessing your students that there's certain things that everyone's struggling with. Well, this is a great opportunity to address those things to the entire class, rather than doing the same feedback over and over to each individual student. Weekly check-ins are a great way to do that. Lastly, weekly check-ins provide you a means of giving students a preview of what's coming up uh, next week. 
so I really recommend that you do this. Um, don't make them too long. Again, I would aim for, for these, I would aim under five minutes. Uh, make them pretty short because you're going to use it once and you're not going to use this video again. Uh, so that's one thing to keep in mind. Okay, so there's Dominique, and I was watching some of the comments on the on the chat, and yes, he is very um, he's very approachable. It doesn't it's not as polished, and I know scientists we tend not to like the things that are very businessly polished like that. I had forgotten that a little bit. I'm not as offended by Steve's um, presentation as some some people were. I like the degree of professionalism that he has brought to it, but. We're not gonna be doing that level of professionalism and you are completely right, it is off-putting to many scientists. So we're kind of aiming more to be a little more like Dominic. But he was still doing the same kinds of things. He was looking at the camera, he was looking away from the camera, but looking back, keeping his focus on the audience, even though he paused and had some hesitations in there, he was very good. And it really felt like after watching Dominic's whole video, which is only about seven minutes long, that I really knew this guy. I, I felt very good about the connection that we had with him. He does have parts of his video where he switches back to the screen and he talks to a screen and then he switches back to himself. So I think that will work very well if you have to do a presentation where you're on screen and you have slides at the same time. <clears throat> there are people who try to do that at the same time. They have their picture up on the screen at the same time their slide is there. You can do that. I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm saying that it is difficult to do that. It is gonna be much easier if when you are talking to the audience and you don't have something on the slide that you actually have to say that your video is on and you're talking to them as Dominique was. was. And then when you have something to say with a slide, you share your screen, you turn off your video and you concentrate on your slide your talk is going to be much easier to put together if you follow the, that advice. You can aim to do the talk the other way with video and slide on at the same time and you can get there to do it, but it's gonna take a little more work. So I don't think that's the starting place. You can give a great talk. I give an example, um, if you follow that advice, I'll give you an example from my class last semester. I was teaching plant systematics when the university closed. The students did presentations in the last part of the course. They were presenting all the plant families, and that was mainly what was in the last few lectures of the course, the student doing presentations. I thought when we moved online that they were going to do much poorer, that the presentations were gonna be much poorer, and I was worried about what it was gonna to do to their grade. That was not the case. They did much better, and the reason I think they did much better is because they all turned off their videos. And when they did that, they didn't have to worry about how they were approaching their audience, what their connection with their audience was, and they could concentrate on the material, and they just, they got it. They got the material much better. So as a starting point, if you have to do those kinds of talks, try not having your video on and work up to the place where you have the video on at the same time. You'll, you'll get there. Let's, uh, do we have any questions in the, Chat, Tim, I have, Kim, I haven't been following it. No, mostly statements uh, about the two presentations, compar comparing the two. Okay, let's take a look at Kristen's, um, Christine Solomon. Now, first, I really, I want you to look at this slide even before you hear her talk. The clip is really short. It's only 20 seconds. Um, you can also look at her over in the left corner there and see how she's relating to the audience. She's not gonna look at the slide or hardly ever glance at it. She's gonna fo be focusing mostly on the audience using the same kind of techniques that we've seen online. But look at that slide. It's simple, it's got a big graphic, it's got a single point on it. It's not trying to make a lots of different, a lots of different points. She will have it animated in a second to show one additional point on it, but it's a minor thing. And this was a characteristic of her whole talk. It's one of the best scientific talks I've heard in the last five years. Each slide had one major point, or each slide was a big graphic that formed a backdrop that she was talking about while she was mainly talking to the audience. So it wasn't really, in, the slides sometimes weren't really informative. They just informed or kind of told you about the kinds of thing that she was really telling you about in person. So let's look at her short video. 
I am going to stop my video. It's hard to count, but sort of a back of the envelope calculation that someone made is that more than <coughs> six million bats um, were killed within just the first six years alone. And bats are, they, they take a long time to, they will take a long time to recover. They're long lived and they only have uh, one pup per year. And so um, recovery is kind of dire. Well, she did look at the slide a couple times, <clears throat> but she brought her attention right back to the audience. So again, really nice presentation, nice slides. This is one of her busier slides. She does have a number of um, points on here. Uh, so I'm giving myself the lie here that she has more than one point on this slide. But again, there's nice, there's nice impacts. And really the main point is the impacts of um, white nose syndrome. WNS. I would have liked if she spelled out white nose syndrome, but since the whole talk was on white nose syndrome, we all knew what it was about there. So I invite now questions from people. If you would like to, people who have questions can un, um, unmute and turn on their videos and we can have a discussion about any of the things that we have talked about today. So if someone has a question, what's the process, Bruce? They can post it in the chat or they can just unmute and or turn on their video and we'll know you're here if you turn on your video. What do you do when the camera is in a different position than the screen and uh, you have to move the camera? I mean, that's the only answer that there is. The camera has to be in the same position of the screen if you're doing the same. If you turn off the camera, right, and you're talking to your slide, which is on the screen, or you're talking to the camera, which is over here, you're okay. You can switch back and forth that way. So that suggestion that I made as a beginning point for doing good online presentations will solve that problem. Otherwise, you have to move the camera. And I know it's not easy. I'm struggling all the time trying to get my camera in a good position. It's, it's a problem. At this point, I've gotten now eight books underneath of my laptop to get the camera where it is right now. Eight. Because five wasn't enough. And then even there, I'm, I'm able to adjust the angle, you know? Hi, we have a question from Eris. Yes. Great. Um, so I did have a question about um, Zoom presentations. It's, it seems, so I TA'd um, this past, you know, March and we had to transition to online and I felt like it was kind of disconcerting um, trying to teach um, and, conversely present when you like just see a bunch of squares on the screen. Um, how, how do you recommend uh, presenting under those circumstances? I, I, I get the feeling that um, typically people don't ask um, their audience to turn on their, their cameras just because, you know, being conscious of people's surroundings. So <clears throat> there's several implied questions there. Like say, first reason why uh, students do often do not turn on their cameras and why we didn't do it here and is bandwidth problems. So in my small class of 17 people, I had two students when they went home did not have um, stable internet. And so they, or they didn't have a camera. So it just wasn't an option for them. And the other students were in better situations, but it was much easier for everyone if the cameras were off because they didn't have to worry about those bandwidth things. So I, I think in teaching a class, it, the cameras are gonna generally have to be off unless you've really got ideal situations with that. And the first part was kind of how do you, how do you deal with that? How do you deal with teaching under those circumstances? That is a good summary. Yeah, um, and I guess conversely presenting because you know as um, well, I guess the the way that TAs teach and depending on the the sections you're teaching, um, you know, you might have a different um, thing that you normally do with your students. But for instance, for me, presenting, uh, let's say, a 15 to 20 minute presentation for my students, and then um, breaking them out and them actually doing an activity is kind of difficult. Um, I guess to, to gauge how they were, how they were learning, um, because I, I don't have like that face, that facial recognition, like, oh, okay, they're bored. I have to change up how I'm, how I'm talking. Um, so yeah, I guess that's kind of challenging of the person to person interaction. <clears throat> so 
the long answer is going to be tomorrow. There's the symposium on teaching systematics and flora courses online. And we we'll touch on some of those kinds of things. My presentation touches on some of those things in that symposium. So I recommend that symposium to get deeper answers to these questions and see how people have dealt with this. But I, I think that there have to be deliverables that the students are responsible for. So I'm going to be doing in the fall mainly asynchronous lectures. And the students have deliverables for each of those lectures. They have to turn in something. Now you can put your videos and you can use different tools like Canvas Studio and things and you put questions in the videos. But I think that that keeps this, those things, keep the students at a very low cognitive level. They don't really have to process the information very highly. So, you know, I'm going to have them turn in um, their notes. I'm going to expect really good notes from my lecturers. I'm going to have them take photographs of them and post them up on the um, Canvas website where I can grade them. I'm actually going to grade them mostly on a mastery basis, but until they get up to the really mastery level, I am actually going to have to grade a few of them. So I think there have to be deliverables because you can't, you're right, you can't tell what they're getting. You can't even tell if they're there. I mean, they can turn the computer on and walk away and do something else. Right. So yeah. I think afterwards that they turn in. I don't think there's another answer to that. Okay. All right. Thank you. That was a lot to unpack for my question. <laughs> but that answered it. Good. Thank you. Kim, do we have some in the chat that we... There's, there's a lot of questions in the chat. Um, you want to read some of them? Sure. Um, there is a question about um, the... Let's see. Um, what, what do you think if a speaker has notes reading during the presentation? Um, I, I answered that one. I said, if, if you're reading, it can seem to your audience like you don't know what you're talking about, unless you're in a situation where reading is the norm, which is not the case for scientific um, presentations as I understand them. Um, Carla's asking, can you change the settings so that all you can see is your presentation slash shared screen so you don't have to see all of the black box void? Oh, that was, it wasn't a question. That's actually something oh, that can. I did. <laughs> Carla, perfect. It's an answer. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so you got an email from the Botanical Society or from Botany 2020 about a week and a half ago or two weeks ago that had some videos that I made about presenting online. And one of those videos shows some video examples of people reading or talking to a camera. One of them is Dominic, but there's another guy I show you. And he's got, there's two sections of his video. One of them has him talking very animatedly to the camera with good audio connections. And another one has him uh, looking off on the side and starting to read something and looking back at the camera. And you can see the difference immediately. And I comment on in the video. So see if you can find those videos or I've just posted it on Twitter. If you find me on Twitter, my Twitter handle is kind of unusual. It is one and only Bruce. And Bruce, did we, did we get to um, the question about um, how do you make your talks more appealing if you're not working on human diseases? This is, uh, uh, you wrote into several SciCom sci trainings and one thing that the instructors emphasize is to make your story more relatable. For example, show a baby picture if you're talking about leukemia. However, I find it too cheesy and cliche. Not everyone is working on cancer. What do we do to make our talks more appealing if we are not working on human diseases, human slash diseases? So I'm, can I understand who's asking this question? Because they, they say they went to SciComm trainings when they're doing this. I've been to several SciComm trainings. Yes, because we have, Kim and I have done SciComm trainings also where we've talked about the same thing. But in those cases, of course, you're talking to a general audience. And we're focusing today on a scientific audience. And so pictures of babies, even if you're working in those areas, are probably not going to go over really well to a scientific audience. They're not. It's a different kind of audience. So um, although we recommend certain kinds of photographs talking to a general audience, we do not recommend them in talking to a scientific audience. Any visual you have to use for a scientific audience has to be related to the main message you want to convey, which is the main result of your research. It's very important that the visuals are focused on that. And you've seen some of the posters where they didn't do that and you see that they're not very, they're not very effective. So if we're talking about ta speaking to a general audience, let's, you may use a real example. 
we had someone who we worked with in our nano school, a school of nanotechnology and nanoscience, and he was working on an aspect of photosynthesis. And he had a really horrible first slide that he used for a three minute thesis that had lots of detail on it and diagrams of different parts of the pathways and so on. And it wasn't communicating very well with the general audience. He replaced that with a picture of a sunflower. And then he talked to the audience about what he wanted them to know about his research. So I think the thing to remember, I'm switching my brain to SciComm mode here. What to remember about a SciComm presentation is that the audience is connecting with you. The audience is generally not interested in the details of what you found. They're usually not interested in your research, even if you're doing you know, research on babies and keeping babies alive. They're not directly interested in that. They become interested in that because you are interested in it and you are gonna show them that there's something there to be interested in. So you put an image on the screen that kind of tells them the general thing that you're working on and tries to say visually what you are gonna tell them and then you connect with the audience and you come on with enthusiasm and clarity and maybe surprise and concreteness and you convince them that this is something interesting and you will be surprised at how interested they are in that, what you're talking about, no matter whether you're talking about um, some weird phylogenetic evolution of genes or aspects of photosynthesis that they've never heard of, things people are actually really interested in these things, but they're interested because they find that interest through you. So that's, I think that's my takeaway from scientific communication. Tell them about your excitement about the thing. Find an image that talks about your excitement about this thing, and you'll convey that to your audience, and then they'll want to know more. Kim, other questions? I have a question regarding uh, more formal presentations, uh, such as, for example, um, in my case, I'm going to present my PhD dissertations uh, shortly. And, and I don't know if the principles that you have to follow in a more informal presentation, like, or in a different kind of audience, are the same as when you are presenting your PhD dissertation. Great question. What I was just saying about a general audience <clears throat> does not and does both apply to a formal presentation like a PhD. So PhD presentations are a different kind of presentation completely. They're not like anything else. They're not like anything we've talked about today. So we've de-emphasized methods, for instance, in posters. In a PhD presentation, unless it's a very unusual department, you need to go through your methods and you need to do them in detail. So the reason that you don't need to do them on posters is because you have gone through the process of being trained in an institution where they've made you do, the de do all the methods, they've made you prove that your methods work, they've made you look at all the little details, and because you've done that process, then when you come to the poster, people are gonna say, oh, they've done, the committee's done that already. Mm -hmm. I don't need to do that, I just need to know what, they've, what the results are. It's been the research has been validated already. So, so all of those things that your your major professor and your committee is telling you to put in your talk, you put those in your talk, and you don't you make sure you follow those directions very carefully. Now, in terms of connection with the audience, that is the same. The more that you can connect to the audience, the more that you can make them understand that you understand all of the stuff that you're talking about, that you understand and can present all of these technical details that you're going through, that you understand your results and you understand them so well that you can present them simply, that's all gonna make you look great. So that part of what we're doing does apply. Do it, do it as simple as you can, make sure you understand it simply. Put all of those kind, of, all the details have to be in there, all the, Fancy graphs have to be in there. All of that stuff has to be in there. But, you know, maybe one graph per slide. Make sure that the slides are very clear. Make sure that the, you know what, you know in detail what's on each slide, why it's there, who else contributed to that research, and what the implications of that research are. And then once you know that very clearly, you 
can communicate to them clearly with confidence. That means you practice it. This all means you practice it multiple times. And since it's an hour long, it's going to take some time to practice it. But PhD things are their own level and they're the hardest things, the hardest kind of talk to do because of this necessity of having detail. No stress there. Okay, thank you so much. It's easier after that. It's all easier after that. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. I hope so. Thank you so much. I think we're going to end. We've got eight minutes until the next presentation starts, and I know you all want to get there. Thank you so much for coming. Really appreciate it. Please tell other people about the workshops. We want to keep improving. It's what I'm all about. Keep growing. Keep getting better at what we do. And tell your scientist friends what you've learned. You, you teach them. <laughs>